Welcome to Moving the Needle on Wicked Problems. Today we are going to speak about income inequality. We all know how income inequality impacts people. The richest groups of Canadians have increased their share of total national income, while the poorest and the middle income groups have lost share. This has only been exacerbated naturally by the pandemic, as those at the lower end of the scale need to go into work, whether they are uh, able to or whether they are healthy, and they have been the hardest hit, uh, risking their health and well-being to look after Canadians. Absolutely, Senator. Income inequality is a big issue in Canada, and the consequences can be devastating. There are health disparities between the well-off and the rest. There are an impact on social cohesion, as many people feel like they are left behind. As Canada charts its course out of the pandemic, this is an important issue that policymakers need to grapple with. So to help us deconstruct this issue and find ways forward, we had a great conversation with two of Canada's most prominent economists, Armin Yalnesian and Miles Korak. If you think economists are boring, you have to listen to this podcast. Let's get to the interview. Hello and welcome to Moving the Needle on Wicked Problems. We are so thrilled to have two outstanding minds to join us on our discussion about income inequality. And they are Dr. Miles Korak and Armin Yalnesian. Dr. Miles Korak is a full professor of economics with the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and senior scholar at the James M. and Kathleen D. Stone Center on Soci Socioeconomic Inequality. His research focuses on dealing with child poverty, access to university education, social and economic mobility, equality of opportunity and unemployment. I so want to be a student of yours, Dr. Cora. <laughs> Armin Yalnesian, who I have known for a very long time in Toronto, is a, in fact, the leading voice, perhaps, uh, I would say, in on Canada's economic scene today. Most recently, she has been appointed by Minister Freeland and Minister Fortier on the task force of women in the economy. And we will get to her perspectives on women in the economy in this conversation. She has served as a senior economic policy advisor to the Deputy Minister of Employment and Social Development and was a senior economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, their inequality project. She is a very frequent contributor to CBC Radio, the TVO's The Agenda with Steve Pakin, business outlets, Bloomberg Markets, etc, etc. So we bring you two great uh, minds today to bear in on the wicked problem of income inequality. And Dr. Korak, I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to start this conversation with centering inequality within the context of the COVID crisis. You have said that the COVID crisis has been the great revealer. What has the crisis revealed to us about ourselves? Well, thank you, Senator. Uh, feel free to call me Miles if, if you're comfortable uh, uh, with that. Um, actually, I, I did write at the beginning of the pandemic about a year ago or so a article for the Toronto Star in which I called um, COVID not the great leveler but the great revealer. Uh, it's the great leveler in the sense that it's a health shock that affects us all. We don't have immunity uh, to it. In that sense we're all in it together but as an economic shock some of us do have immunity. And it's in that sense I was speaking of it as the great revealer. It's revealing long-standing divides in the way we work and the way we engage uh, in the workplace and the incomes uh, we, we earn. Uh, we've known for decades and decades that there's a growing polarization in incomes in, in Canada. And my use of that phrase was to suggest that COVID just brought those into sharp relief. Um, if you recall when the crisis hit and since that time, if you were not in public facing employment, if you were a professional, if you could work at home, um, you kept working. <laughs> you probably worked harder. Uh, what's the big deal about working at home when you spend most of your time working from an airplane seat anyways? Um, on the other hand, 
so for, for some groups in society, um, the world of work didn't really change that much. I mean, certainly there were challenges in, in working from home, um, but income security was not challenged. In fact, savings increased for many people and um, the, um, the stock market behaved in a way that actually mm -hmm. improved wealth standing for many. But on the other hand, if you were in public facing employment, if you were in the service sector, young uh, female uh, workers in particular saw an astounding, unprecedented drop in employment and in hours and still a year later are struggling to get back on their feet, particularly in retail, in, in, in arts, and in other public facing sectors. Precarity is a way of life for many people, day in, day out, year in, year out. And COVID gave us the opportunity to see the sharpest contrast uh, of, uh, of that experience uh, in a way that I think was evident to most of us, but much more sharp now and more exacerbated. So it's a revealer of long-standing divides in the world of work. Very true. People like to say we're in the same boat, but we're not actually. We're in the same ocean as someone has said, and some are in luxury yachts and some are in life jackets trying to grab on for life. Uh, profess the Professor Miles used the word precarity. I mean, let's transition over to your language, which is, I believe, which will find its place in the economic lexicons of, of, uh, of the world. And that coin, that word is she session. And you, you, you hone in on the double, triple negative impacts on women. Can you elaborate a bit on those impacts for us? Yes, of course. Um, I didn't invent the word he session, which is a portmanteau that the New York Times created in 2009 to describe who was most impacted by the uh, de decline of economic activity in the wake of the global financial crisis. Uh, about two months after the New York Times coined that, I published a, a very long piece about how we were not recession ready, that our EI program wasn't recession ready. And in it, I, I showed a bunch of charts that showed how every recession is a he session, at least it had been until that point. And that the initial phases of job recovery were always a she covery in that women would pick up whatever kind of just in time work that was available in primarily the service sector to make ends meet uh, because men had a much higher reservation wage. So when a he session hits, historically, it's men in the goods producing industries of manufacturing, resource extraction, and construction, all of which tend to be pretty well paid. And so they're a little bit reluctant to take crap jobs in the service sector, but usually they're partner, uh, who is a woman, has been since the 1950s willing to roll up her sleeves and contribute to the family's income. And over time, women became just as important in the labor market as men. They never went back home. Their labor force participation rates always increased in the wake of a recession um, and never went back down until uh, somewhere around the mid somewhere around the wake of the last recession, the 2008-9 recession, when we heard what was happening around the world, uh, from China, then to Europe, and then to uh, North America, you could tell this was going to be a categorically different recession because it wasn't the goods producing industries that were shut down. Mm -hmm. It were the not, it was the non-essential services. And who works in the non-essential services? Women do. Low paid workers do. The non-essential services tend to be lower paid because they are not essential and they tend to be marginal businesses, marginal retail, marginal bars and restaurants, marginal personal services like hair and nail salons, uh, tourism, accommodation, hospitality. All of mm -hmm. these things tend to be populated by people who are lower paid because there's lower margins and that tends to attract people. Uh, well, the people who tend to do those jobs tend to be visible minorities, recent immigrants, migrant workers, and in every single category, women. So in the first two months of this recession, the first ever global she session, women in Canada accounted for 63% of the job loss, unheard of. 
in previous recessions. And who bounced back first? Men did. If you remember, rem will remember when we started reopening in spring last year, the first jobs to reopen were in uh, garden centers, in marinas, on golf courses, in car lots. Those were all key jobs. So we had exactly a perfect symmetry, the perfect upside downness of the world according to typical recessions. And here a year later, as Miles has pointed out, the people still hardest hit have been the youngest women. But we have also seen more women, about 10 times as many women who are not teenagers, drop out as men who are not teenagers because there has either been too much demand on them to do work from home, plus homeschooling, plus childcare because of lack of safe reopening of schools and actual reduction in capacity to provide childcare or because they weren't ever able to get back into the labor market, they got knocked out and there is nothing to go back into in the first place and they've stopped looking. So we've had about 100,000 women drop out of the labor force at a time when overall there's been more men added to the labor force. And we don't know if the she session is over. The last two prints of the labor force survey looked pretty darn solid, except for young people, particularly young women, as Miles has said. But we still have this really troubling number of women that have dropped out of the labor force entirely. That's never a good story for macroeconomic recovery. And as I've been saying for over a year, there will be no recovery without a she recovery, and there can be no she recovery without childcare. I, I, I hope from your lips to the minister's ears for sure. I just want to query a little in, in previous time, in previous uh, economic upswings and downswings when people have lost jobs. Uh, as your as your uh, you know clarifying women have lost the most amount of jobs young women as well have they not automatically tended to go back into education and that in the long term is a good thing have you seen that sort of I don't have a job I'm not getting a job so I I should invest in myself and go back to school we have more than one thing going on depending on the age group so for those who are under 25 we have seen it long-term trend towards lower employment rates because yes more women are more women and men are going back into some kind of training or education when they lose their work that is more true for women than men historically it's unclear what is going to be happening in the middle of this recession because of remote learning and because tuition prices continue to rise um, and a lot of what has happened in terms of age groups that are going back to school, especially the post-secondary industry, as you both know, have been propped up in Canada by international students, paying triple uh, the rates of tuition of domestic students. And we have just seen an explosion of international students. So we don't know where any of that is going. But men's employment rate has been tracking down since, since the 1970s for all age groups, and particularly of those males over the age of 55. That's partly because we had good pensions in the 70s and 80s, and so more people were able to start retiring in the 90s. That may have played itself out. More people might have to work as they get older because they don't have pensions, but we're continuing to see employment to population ratios decline for men. And now we've seen a plateau for women, uh, for all age groups. Uh, so we're not quite sure if we're at an inflection point or not, and it is not being driven primarily by those who are of age to go to school. There's something else that is afoot that is a far bigger and problematic story about what proportion of the population has access to work and that that work be good work, well-paying work, living wages, that it doesn't have us living to work rather than working to live. Thank you. Now, Miles, you, you mentioned in your um, sort of opening answer to the question, you, you had mentioned that you know the pandemic hasn't uh, hit every group as hard as others, right? There, there seems to be an, a wealth accumulation uh, at the very top. There's, there's CEOs that are making even more money as the as the pandemic has gone on, you know, people like Jeff Bezos of Amazon, uh, you know, are making all of these all of this money based off of the platforms that they they control and the businesses that they run. Um, but you know, I'm wondering what are the sort of long term consequences that you can see of you know having such an accumulation of wealth at the top? Well. Um 
inequality has been on the rise for a while, although it's paused in Canada over the last couple of, 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 of decades. Um, I think accumulation of wealth at the top raises a, a couple of uh, issues for public policy. Um, one is the way we structure the tax system. I always look at public policy through the lens of the child, thinking about the consequences for the intergenerational transmission of inequality, thinking about the capacities of children to become all that they can be. So different types of inequalities will affect that differently. How does top-end inequality affect that? Well, top-end inequality is going to sort of erode equality of opportunity in the sense that financial transfers across generations are going to increase in a way that might rub against our notions of equality of, 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 of fairness. So I wonder if now is not the time for public policy to think about uh, proper taxation of particularly uh, capital income and inheritance of taxes. After all, if we believe in equality of opportunity, we believe that everyone should succeed according to their talents, their energies, and their motivations. So if we have two equally talented, motivated people, but uh, one comes from a family in the top 1%, he or she is going to have the bank of mom and dad behind her when they come to the housing market, when they come to set up a family, as they progress through uh, e education. And that's just sheer uh, luck <laughs> of being born uh, to the right people at the, at, at the right time. The other aspect is just sort of a notion of, of fairness. Right now, capital income gets taxed at half the rate as labor income. Um, historically, there's been a rationale for that. E economists have brought a number of, of reasons why that might be um, suitable in a tax system. But all of those reasons have eroded since that um, uh, that 50 percent uh, rate was introduced. It's a call for higher taxation on capital income as well as thinking about inheritance taxes. So I think higher end inequality has its first policy implication in the tax system. But the second is just more broadly about the challenges of 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 being in it all together. With higher top end inequality, there's more of a opportunity um, for the rich to hive them off of themselves off of society and not engage in promoting public policies that are a benefit for the for the for the uh, many. Well, think of you know childcare, which Armin uh, talked about. Uh, the most vocal, the most engaged people are, are people at the top, and if they can opt out by designing a a program of having immigrants come into their households at really cheap wages, why bother engaging with the rest of us in a conversation about how we should structure uh, our, 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 the interface between family and society? So there are probably many examples of, of that. Pressures on the schooling system, pressure, pressures on how we provide public goods, the design of our cities, all in the long run will be influenced by top end inequality. It's not to say that we shouldn't be worried about the bottom 40%. Indeed, that's another type of inequality that we should be very much worried about. So I know we're all looking forward to what this government's intentions uh, are in terms of taxing extreme wealth and inequality, as they have said in the throne speech from the throne. So we're all looking forward to it. But I wonder if you, Miles, can, can weigh in on on Canadians' awareness of income inequality. I mean, typically, uh, awareness rises when unemployment is is high. I, I I think that's that's pretty easy to understand. And unemployment is pretty high right now because of the pandemic. Are we are we not paying enough attention to inequality because we're paying so much attention to health and safety? Well, that's an interesting question that might be even a little bit beyond my uh, uh, pay level, uh, the notion of what are our reference groups. Mm -hmm. But it certainly struck me in the Great Recession that all of the lived through in 2007, 2008, that there was nothing like seeing the economic pie shrink before your eyes that made citizens wonder a little bit more about how the slices were divided. Uh, in Canada, I think we see that too. It plays out in a different way, but um, possibly regionally as well. When potash and oil prices collapsed, 
and it had a major impacts on people in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Became, became more, uh, we became much more aware of regional uh, uh, divides. I think people don't look um, too much beyond themselves uh, in making comparisons. Um, and so I think the relevant comparisons are twofold. Um, one, the bottom 40% versus the middle. So these are people who just in the bottom 40% just probably had some bad luck and yet they see people just like themselves managing uh, quite well. It makes you wonder not just about our poverty alleviation programs, but also the programs we have to support people in times of uncertainty, insurance programs. And so the government has to pursue an agenda of making life and the uncertainties of life more manageable for more people. Our unemployment insurance system, uh, the poor thing, it was a, a deer <laughs> caught in the headlights. Uh, it, it just, as we hit COVID, uh, uh, this huge shock that collectively affects us all, the reason we have employment insurance, and it was found so terribly wanting, mm -hmm. covering only 40% of the unemployed, uh, administrative bottlenecks that had to be worked around. We need an agenda there uh, to address uncertainty. And if if that kind of um, security is offered people, then maybe you know they can appreciate their position a little bit better in life and manage it better and worry less about ingrained mm -hmm. in, in inequalities that often uh, divide us. I, I hope that's sort of speaking roughly uh, to your uh, question. This no. is a no, conversation say, which, yeah, carry no, on. No, add Senator, please. No, no, I think this is a great conversation that just sort of leads into other directions. But Paul has a really important question, uh, so let's let him get to that. Well, I was thinking, Armin, uh, you know, obviously we've been talking about income inequality and, and the pandemic mostly, but obviously income inequality has existed for many decades in Canada, continues to to get worse. and. And, and I'm wondering about, you know, Miles has sort of talked about some of the ideas about taxation policy that could be used for Canada to deal with this issue. Do you have any further ideas on there? And I, and I also have one actually question as well, a little bit. Of, is it time for, and if I remember correctly, the, another Carter Commission to look at taxation, you know, by parliamentarians actually looking at the tax system altogether to be able to understand where changes are needed so we can deal with this income inequality? Oh, Paul, <laughs> that's a mouthful of questions there. Okay, first of all, I need to correct your comment and echo what Miles said about income inequality. It has not been rising dramatically in the last about 15 years. Um, you know, our income inequality data is about two years out of date anyway. We did notice that when the Canada Child Benefit was brought in, yes. there was a reduction in poverty and then consequently... Um, a reduction in inequality because you were bringing the bottom up um, and there wasn't the same kind of major change happening at the top to increase that. Yeah. Why did Canada's inequality plateau but not get worse as our economy expanded during a commodity super cycle? People say, oh, it didn't get worse, but we were going through a commodity super cycle. It's like, yeah. what would it take to reverse growing inequality? Apparently, Certainly not GDP growth was enough to do it. So we, we do have this kind of problematique where we don't even know what would it take to reverse growing inequality. It plateaued because of two reasons, the commodity super cycle and gr the growing role of women in Canada, a rising employment to population ratio, a rising group of women who did take on post-secondary education because it was more affordable than in the US and then they could deploy that human capital because there was more access to childcare than, it, than in the US. And these combinations meant more women were doing more paid work in the labor market, which helped out household incomes more than in the US. So we didn't hollow out the middle quite as rapidly as the US. That is nothing to celebrate because the US, nobody does extreme like the US does when it comes to inequality. And we have plateaued at the highest rate on record since the 1970s in Canada. So to say that it hasn't gotten worse is no celebration, but it didn't get worse. And now we are not, we have gone through the looking glass in terms of a global pandemic that has upside down everything to do with supply chains, women's labor force participation rates, 
We don't know what end is up on the other side of the pandemic, but we do know one thing. We know that the care economy and contributes more just and the care economy, I'm including all of health and all of education. And I'm only counting paid exchanges. I'm not talking about anything that is unpaid. So just in terms of paid health and education, it accounts for more than 12.3% of GDP. The only thing that comes close to rivaling that is real estate. Nothing else comes closer in the Canadian economy. And when it comes to the number, the share of paid jobs in the job market, it accounts for over 21% of all paid jobs. Nothing rivals it. And when you think about the amount of energy we put into talking about manufacturing and exports like oil and gas and blah, 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 the care economy is right under our nose and we're ignoring it. It is what will get us through the pandemic and it will put us onto the other side of the pandemic, but we're not talking about how do we make every job a good job in that sector. So going back to inequality, inequality in Canada is color-coded and the pandemic really revealed that. In Toronto, 76% of the cases of COVID are for racialized populations that are doing the essential work. You know, Miles was saying some people never got hurt at all in terms of their ability to do work if they could work from home. StatCan tells us only 41% of Canadians who are still working could work from home. That means the majority of work gets done in a place, is dealing with other people. And a lot of that work is low pay, and a lot of that work is done by racialized people, and a lot of those people are not getting vaccinated. They are not at the front end of the queue for how they get protections against infection. So we do have huge types of inequality that are accelerating as we speak, that will get worse on the other side, because everybody's going to say, oh, our deficit is so big. Well, of course, we can't afford to pay for it. But I want to go to what um, Miles talked about way earlier. Not only is it time, perhaps, to talk about a synthetic view, a new Carter Commission. People are, were talking about that. In fact, I think the Liberal administration in 2015, when they were campaigning, were talking about the need for a tax review, just like they talked about the need for an employment, review, employment insurance review. Neither happened. So maybe we need to you know, hold their feet to the fire, though there have been certainly tons of reforms done to EI. I think Miles is absolutely right that the idea of creating more security through our forms of income programs is more important than even a tax review, but some, at some point maybe the, the bill will come. And we do need to talk about what's the fairest way of uh, taxing each other to create the world we want to live in. Let us not forget we are still the 10th largest economy on the surface of the planet with a fraction of the population. We can be any kind of a country we want to be. We can build whatever we want, but we have to understand how to do that in a way that builds the economy and builds human potential from the bottom up. That's the lesson of public health. If you raise the health gradient from the bottom up, you improve everybody's health. That's true in economics too. Now, Paul, now besides sort of taxation sort of ideas, is there other sort of social programs that, you know, that, and then both of you have already, I think mentioned it already, the, you know, childcare being one, right? That that could be something that, you know, in, in greater uh, certainty for, for Canadians that they could latch onto to help with this sort of situation. Is is there any sort of other ideas out there that, that uh, for social programs that we could access, Miles? Um, Paul, let me just take that question a little bit further. I mean, we're, we're putting a lot of emphasis on our tax and transfer programs, but there is a type of inequality that really matters, and that's before tax and transfers, mm -hmm. the actual structure of the workplace. The mm -hmm. COVID made clear uh, to us that we might sort of question or rethink how we value work. Yeah, we had a great deal of discussion about quote unquote essential workers, workers. and um, whether they were being paid uh, fairly. Um, that notion of fairness that got some workers in some sectors a short term bump in their wages isn't going to last unless you fundamentally change the bargaining power that workers have in the workplace. So I think we also have to think not just about tax program, taxation system. Um, just about and insurance programs, but also the place of workers in the workplace and their bargaining power. 
the right to disconnect is going to become more and more important in regulating uh, how this new workplace functions. Um, workers are only going to be able to get wage gains ultimately if they have more bargaining power. And there's a question of how we properly regulate uh, the workplace, how the EI system fits with that and gives workers capacity uh, to find uh, that so-called living uh, uh, wage. And ultimately, the tax transfer system can only do so much lifting, and, and we haven't paid much attention to the structure of workplaces. Um, unions historically played an important role in giving workers voice, and we need in some sectors to find substitutes uh, of, of, of for that. Um, but to get to your question, I think uh, we should really seriously think about employment insurance and how it interfaces with a, uh, a basic income of some sort to support the, um, the bottom uh, 40 percent. Uh, Senator, I don't know if you wanted to jump in. Well, I, I, we, we will get to the question of uh, uh, UBI or GLI, whatever okay. we call it. But I have a, a more literary question because I, I like to read. I'm, I'm a great admirer of F, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and you've <laughs> coined uh, uh, an economic theory called the Great Gatsby Curve. Yeah. And perhaps you can help me understand what that is. All right, that's fair enough. <laughs> And actually, I just finished reading The Great Gatsby because yeah. I'm writing an introduction to a new edition of the novel. So <laughs> I'm going to make sure you buy a copy of yes. that uh, new yes. edition, okay. leather bound and all. Um, but the the novel, of course, is about um, a rather sad character in the yeah. end, uh, Jay Gatsby, who aspires to more than he is. And he wants to climb the uh, the ladder, the American ladder in pursuit of success. And ultimately, um, the rules of the game work against him. And it's about the American dream and how inequality uh, threatens that dream. And so it's that that the Great Gatsby curve refers to. I, um, some years ago, uh, I work in the area of intergenerational income mobility, which just basically means the capacity of people to change their lot in life, to move from their family background to another strata. Um, entirely in economic terms, so strata for me are defined as income. Can you move from being born in the bottom 20% to being an adult in the top 20%, say? That notion of mobility across generations is wrapped up with the American dream. Um, but what I added to this conversation is that societies that have more in inequality at a point in time have less mobility. So the Amer American society is often more tolerant of inequality because Americans believed that with that inequality came more opportunity, that there was this mixing of, of groups continually. And in fact, the Great Gatsby sh Curve shows that it's just the opposite. If you live in a country like Denmark or Finland, where there is lower inequality, there is more movement across the income distribution. If you live in the United States or in the United Kingdom or Italy, there's more inequality and there's less movement out of social brackets. And Canada sits somewhere in the middle. In the middle. What the Great Gatsby Curve ultimately tells us for public policy is that if you're concerned about equality of opportunity, you should be concerned about inequality of outcome as well. Uh, different types of inequality influence opportunity in different ways. You should continually battle against poverty and child poverty. Uh, that is the major break on children being able to move upward. And you shouldn't let inequalities between the middle and the top get too out of hand because that's corrosive to our sense of, of, of in it all together, if you will. So the Great Gatsby Curve uh, tries to put some statistics to the experience of a hapless, uh, unfortunate character who lived during the jazz age in the 1920s when the last time we saw the type of inequality that we're living through now um, dominated American uh, and Canadian lives. So I'll probably never think of Jay Gatsby quite in the same way again after this conversation. So thank you for that. My next question is to both of you. I'll, you know, first to Armin. 
we are, uh, you know, we're waiting, all waiting for Monday's budget in Canada. So I, I'm, I'm going to blue sky a little. Imagine you are the Minister of Finance, I mean, you're not her advisor, you are the minister. Uh, which policy, and, and let's just choose one, would you put in that budget to address inequality? Which one policy? Senator, that is a difficult question because I think it is the wrong question. It's the first okay. budget in two years. It's the first budget in two years mm -hmm. in a process that has walked us all through the looking glass where deficits are less meaningful than they ever have been before, where it is existential issues surround us. Life and death surrounds us. Meaninglessness and meaning surround us. Uh, so I think we are seeing what we thought we were seeing at the end of the 2008-9 global financial crisis, which was, oh, look, the recipe for growth did not deliver. All the things that Miles has been talking about uh, in his Great Gatsby work and intergenerational mobility somewhere around the year 2010 came an explosion of work from Emmanuel Saez and uh, Thomas Piketty from others picking up the work of Simon Kuznets in the 1950s. Simon Kuznets was the one who in the 1950s was tracking how inequality changed with the onslaught of industrialization and the advancement of expanding GDP in country after country after country. And somewhere around the somewhere around 1958, after doing dozens of countries in Canada was a contributor to this international effort to understand how inequality had changed over time. He was the one that basically came up with the idea that a rising tide lifts all boats. And rising GDP is the best thing for reducing inequality. So when Saez and Piketty pulled together the data from the 1950s to date, they saw a, an absolute reversal of the Kuznets curve, which was at the beginning when you introduce industrialization, you see growing inequality as the economy takes off on all cylinders, but then it falls as more people join in the party. Um, and that is partly because of unionization, as Miles has said, but it was partly because of changes in regulations and the ability to understand that we needed more security in the system too. We need better pensions, we need better income security, we need better hospitals and schools. All of those things came into play in the wake of all the growth. So actually understanding what the causation was of broad-based prosperity was not simply GDP growing. And that's what, uh, what um, work like Miles, but certainly work like Saez and Piketty started revealing that in country after country, we were seeing that a rising tide was not lifting all lifting boats. Up. In fact, it was creating more inequality, not less. The secret sauce was not more GDP. The secret sauce was better regulations and better distribution. And to Miles' point earlier, better pre-distribution, not just better redistribution of resources, but better uh, access to employment opportunities that were well paid and well distributed throughout the throughout the regions of an economy. So in answer to your questions, what's the single policy? I would say we are now moving to a new narrative. And the single thing I hope for in a budget that we have waited for for two years, and we now have the first female finance minister in our history, in the first self-declared feminist government of our history, in the first global she session in the world's history, Tell us a new story about what government is for and who it is for. What are we trying to achieve together? What is going to take us through this pandemic and onto the other side? And I would say at the heart of all of that is the care economy. It's right under our nose by the simple metrics, but how do we harness its power? How do we make care for our own human potential and for our economic potential of the future at the very center of everything government makes as its mission. And so to me, it is a narrative, mission-oriented uh, challenge. I, I have no idea what she's gonna do with it, but I have told her in my capacity on the task force that I think that the number one job is to tell us all a story of what you are trying to do as the government in this uncertain time. Miles has reinforced the word uncertainty so many times, and that is what 
in 2010, uh, Christine Lagarde started reinforcing. It's an uncertain time. We don't know how we're going to get through this. That uncertainty morphed at the IMF, the World Bank, and the OECD into a call, a clarion call, for inclusive growth with the acknowledgement that growth by itself, without inclusivity, was not going to get us to where we said we wanted to go, even in the most mainstream of economic institutions. So what is the new story? What is the flesh on the bones of inclusive growth? How do we get there? That's the single policy I am looking for. I know how I would do it, but I don't know how she would do it. Well, we are all looking forward to that. And I, I you know, uh, politicians look for simple answers. So I fell into that, um, uh, what do you call it? That, that temptation, because I, you know, we're all sort of hoping that there will be things in the budget that will really move uh, uh, the needle on inequality for people at the bottom of the ladder. And you're perfectly right. It is the care economy. Um, Miles, do you have a response to that? Well, let me uh, let me take your question in a different way. I, mean, I, I know you, um, by just pointing out that you just want like one simple policy, one response. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a talking point. I accept everything that uh, Armin said, but let me just sort of be the counterfoil here and let's go back and pretend to be uh, a minister of finance with a, with a strong deputy. Uh, and historically, what do we think of the Department of Finance is doing? Uh, the, the Department of Finance is the guardian of a sane taxation system. Administratively simple, uh, effic promoting efficiency, and some notion of fairness. So uh, let me just play the game with you. And if I had to point out uh, one policy that this minister and her deputy should put forward, Let's take the government at its word. In the Thone speech, she talked about uh, taxing the wealthy more. She, uh, or, uh, or the government had, though, a very narrow understanding uh, of that. Uh, the government also voted against wealth taxation in, in, in the House. Where's the middle ground between this? I think it's just to rely on the traditional litmus test of what a deputy minister or a minister of finance does. It's an efficient and fair tax system. Exempting capital gains from taxation is no longer efficient, it's no longer fair, fair, and it's leading to all sorts of administrative complexities. So in the traditional role of a finance minister, she should be addressing uh, that. Terrific. Uh, Paul, you have a question on UBI? I know these, I think you, both of you, if I'm not right, you disagree with each other on universe, and it's good to get some variation on, on, on the policy discussion. So, Paul, if you'll forgive me, let me just ask the question since I weighed into. So, <laughs> what do you think of UBI? Who are you asking first? I'll ask you. So, I think it goes back to the idea of security and what creates the most security. Because we are certainly, we know that in the wake of every recession, there is a spike in demand for on-demand work. And it materializes differently in every recession, but it happens in every recession. And we know that already young workers, those under the age of 30, are seeing, we're seeing a rise in temporary work as a share of all their work. And temporary work, by its nature, means more income volatility. So they need more form of some kind of stability from something else. Now, it might be income stability. It might be income insurance or wage insurance, or maybe it's UBI. But I would argue that there's no amount of money you could put into a UBI that would create as much security as knowing that you have an affordable place to live. You have affordable access to high quality childcare, that you can get mental health care if you need it, that you can get pharma care if you need it, drug and dental care if you need it, without having to worry about how much money do you have in this pocket or that pocket. These are things that we can provide to one another as a part of a social wage. The price tag of providing it collectively, everywhere, effectively, affordably, at a high quality, so it can be regulated, publicly managed and regulated, is far cheaper than income supports. And you get it irrespective of your income. It isn't clawed back. You don't have to worry about does another $500 a month or another $1,000 a month get me all these things. It can't. There's no way it can but we can give it to one another. And I would recommend that we focus on these uh, 
elements of social programs that are part of the social wage uh, because in the coming years, we've got about three decades of population aging to get through. You know, the, the baby boom has been a phenomenon. It's been like watching a python eat a rabbit and watch the rabbit move through the body of the python, right? Well, you can see it coming from the 50s on. This is not a surprise. As And we saw it actually in the months leading up to the pandemic. We saw every month on both sides of the border, both in the United States and Canada, record low unemployment rates. Rates we hadn't seen for 40, 45 years. And that was because we had more people exiting the labor market because of population aging than entering because of declining fertility rates. And yes, we had opened up the taps on immigration and migrant workers, but not enough to prevent this kind of tightening of the labor market. And once the pandemic is over, I know it's hard to think about right now. Once it's over, we are back into a whole world of widespread labor and skill shortages that will go on for decades. No senior is go going to want to see wages go up because they are living on fixed incomes and about a quarter of our population, but one in four people will be living on lower incomes than they are now. And those incomes are not gonna go up unless somebody raises their pensions. So they don't wanna see inflation. And young people don't wanna see inflation because they're not getting enough steady work with an, enough pay. So unless suddenly there's some wild move uh, to see more unions everywhere, Wages are not going to go up. What's the best way to raise quality of life for all these people that are now going to be facing a dependency ratio that we faced in the late 50s, but with half the background rate of growth and way more pressure to, to help those who are too young, too old and too sick to work because there's not somebody at home providing unpaid care who's the woman because we're going to need all hands on deck. That requires a more generous social wage, which is there for you, irrespective of your income. That is the way we are going to improve people's lives and increase security in a far less easy to undo way mm -hmm. than through more dollars in your pocket, which an incoming administration can either reduce, freeze, or get rid of. Okay. Miles? Um, what do I think about uh, UBI? Um, one, I think we sort of have to parse how this conversation is taking uh, place. I think for many people, UBI is sort of a a, a call, a, a, a call for um, less poverty, uh, less inequality, or or maybe more simplicity and ease in um, in um, receiving government income uh, benefits, and that's distinct from the actual practical design of income support. So we can all agree on these big principles, this, this call. The question is how to step forward. My own feeling is that the government has the tools in place right now to make significant uh, steps in reforming the uh, income transfer program. And particularly now in a period of COVID and in the context of the provinces, I wonder if it isn't time for the federal government to be occupying the income transfer space and taking those that responsibility from the provinces in some way and leaving them to address in-kind benefits or more targeted benefits for them and the and, and municipalities. How would it do that? And, and, and doing that, I, I should say, is of some benefit because we get away from this game playing. You know, the federal government expands income support in some dimensions and provinces claw them back in others. We, we, we play that game for decades in, 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 in Canada. We continue to play it now. So there's a need for this sort of collective uh, view. How would the federal government do that? I think it, it could use the models it already has. We do have, if you will, a type of basic income for elderly Canadians. We do have a type of basic income for families with children. The Canada Child Benefit has, has been built up in a very admirable uh, way. What's missing in this safety net, of course, 
precarious work, living on their own, uh, possibly, or just with another partner. It's a program called the Canada Workers' Benefit. It's too small to really have a bite, but you could build upon that in conjunction with the poverty reduction strategy. You could put an unconditional income transfer into the Canada Workers' Benefit, generous enough to meet the deep poverty uh, uh, target that's in the poverty reduction strategy. And then you would scale it according to uh, employment income as we do the Canada Child Benefit in, in some way. It would cover everybody. And then what I would do is I would just take the number of hours worked of anyone who collects the Canada Workers Benefit and transform it into EI eligible hours regardless of, of the nature of the work, whether it's gig work, self-employed work, or piecing together part-time work, just take that income and translate it into eligible hours. And these people then also have an EI program that also backstops them and solves the problem of the low coverage of, of EI. And so it's like, um, I sort of feel that public policy should move forward incrementally in significant steps from the precedents it's set, it's set already, and it should downplay the vestigial structures that are legacy uh, programs. So I don't know whether you want to call that UBI or not, but there's a need to think about a smooth, easy to access, comprehensive system of income supports that surely will, I, in some important way, complement the public goods agenda that Armin is also so carefully articulated. This has been very helpful. I, I, I wish we could somehow, and we will capture this and blast it out with your help. And But I, I'm coming to my last question, and it's about a file that I care deeply about and it is migration. Uh, and Armin, I, I am a huge admirer of the work that you have done recently on migrant workers and essential workers and the care economy, all of that is tied in. Uh, and now, yesterday, the minister announced a, a, a pretty interesting program that would move uh, people from from temporary status to permanent status. And I'm talking in particular about, you know, the, the the most vulnerable people in the care economy, whether it's farmers or caregivers or or, or truck drivers or meat packers. I sort of put them all in together. Do you believe uh, there's it's a political policy question? Do you believe this is a stop in the way because the government needs to fill its targets for this year? Or is this a move that we can build on incrementally to ensure that in the future when we think of migration and immigration to Canada, we take a look at the labor market as a whole as opposed to our previous addiction to skilled workers and skilled workers only. So the answer to your question is this a stop along the way or is this something that can be built on? Yes and yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it a stop along the way? Is this the end of it? Well, that's the way it's been announced. 90,000 people yes. uh, transitioned from temporary status to permanent status amongst the, by the way, roughly 1.6 million people who are in temporary resident status in Canada right now. So it's not a large number of people that are making this transition. Um, and it's a one-off. He's made it clear it's a one-off. If I had been giving him advice, I would have said, you need to do three things, minimum three things. You need to articulate a vision of how immigration fits in with the moment that we are in, which is widespread labor and skill shortages, that we are preparing for those, that we are, well, this is an historic opportunity to take marginalized Canadians who are systemically denied opportunities uh, for training and good jobs, and it's a chance to bring them in to the mainstream. Uh, to make sure that more of the jobs are filled by those that who would have otherwise been silent. So that our first door that we walk through when an employer can't find somebody is, oh, turn on the temporary foreign worker mm -hmm. cap, right? Because that's the way we deal with labor and skill shortages right now. Um, the second thing I would say is, so you need to be working in alignment with the Minister of Employment and Social Development. There has to be coherence in the way these two ORs are working, so we're not 
rowing in two different directions at the same time. The second thing, and, and by the way, I have said this to the minister. The second thing I would say is you have an opportunity here to lay out a transformative vision of what immigration looks like in this country. Somewhere around 2006, we flipped the script on how Canada was built. We went from permanent migration being an immigration. You know, Canada is a country of immigrants. Well, what are immigrants? They are people that come here, they have skin in the game, they build their lives here. We went from a country that was built on immigrants to letting in two and a half times as many temporary residents as the permanent residents that we let in in the year before the pandemic. Like that started in 2006 and only escalated. Was that by accident? Is it a public policy discussion that nobody ever had? You know, why aren't we talking about what is the relationship between temporary and permanent and how we're going to build the future of Canada and how we are going to address absolutely predictable labor and skill shortages up and down the income and pay spectrum, by the way. The third thing I would say is it's great that you have this one off for 90,000 people making the transition from temporary to permanent. It should come as part of a multi-year spectrum thing so that you are reducing the overall number of temporary people that you're, you know, maybe it's a two phase, mm -hmm. you know, Canadian citizenship thing. If you're here and you prove yourself, yep. maybe you can get in and be permanent. And that's just the way we do it for some people. But that isn't what was said. It was just like, hey, you've been so great during the pandemic. Let us give you permanent status. It's like, this shouldn't be a gift. This should be a policy. Um, and the, the last thing I will say on this is that um, it's still not clear to me that we don't have 90,000 people moving from temporary to permanent status, but we are still opening up the tap even more on more temporary people coming in. So this relationship between who is here and who is going to be let in is super critical. And there we have about 140,000 people who, made, who went through all the hoops to become a permanent resident. That is the most vaunted status you could hope. And they had clearance in March of 2020. And we are now letting TRs get in before PRs, even the PRs who were accepted a year ago. We got to make good on our promise to those people because, again, in the wake of the pandemic, the entire global north is dealing with population aging. You think we can have whoever we want, we're going to be competing with every other rich country to get um, mm -hmm. newcomers to come here to help us maintain our status quo in our standard of living and improve our lives. So if you want to be a people magnet for the people of the future, you better make good on your promises. So we've got a real problem if we're not making good on the promises we made to people already uh, who are still waiting to come here to build their lives. Yeah. You're, you're right. My my social media feed is sort of being flooded by all the visa holders who have gone through the hoops and now find that they are really second or third rate. And I wonder what this does to our reputation over the long time. I could carry on this conversation, Miles and Armin, for a very long time, but I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you for a very fascinating and animated discussion. You know, those people who think economists are boring will listen to this podcast and change their mind. So I thank you. I really do. Uh, to our listeners, check out future episodes. Send us your suggestion for fascinating speakers as we continue to dive into, you know, looking at solutions for problems that our country is facing. And thank you again. And goodbye. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Senator.